Today is March 10th, 2022, and my guest is educator and author Roosevelt Montas of Columbia University, where he is senior lecturer in American Studies and English and the former director of Columbia's Center for the Core Curriculum between 2008 and 2018. He is the author of, great title, the author of Rescuing Socrates, How the Great Books Changed My Life and Why They Matter for a New Generation, which is our subject for today. Roosevelt, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you. It's great to be here, Russ. Now, I want to say um, I love this book. Um, it's a fantastic book. And in many ways, it's the culmination of a number of Econ Talk episodes in recent years, as well as capturing my own journey to become the president of Israel's only liberal arts college. Um, what makes the book so powerful is you integrate your own educational journey with your life experience. But I want to start with a little bit of your history. You were the director of Columbia's core curriculum for 10 years. Uh, some listeners won't know what that is, hard to believe, but they won't know about what Columbia's core curriculum is. So uh, tell us about it. Sure. Um, well, first, thank you for inviting me here and for the work you're doing at Shalem, an institution that I admire and whose um, uh, well-being matters a lot. Um, to me, but I think it matters matters in in the world. Um, thanks for your for your work there. Um, Columbia's core curriculum is the oldest thing of its type. It it in in 2019 celebrated its centennial. Um, and the, the the briefest way to put it is that it's a set of required courses for all undergraduates in roughly speaking the Western classics. Um, it includes a course in music. Um, again, roughly Western music and a course in art. Um, but at the centerpiece are these two year long courses in roughly speaking great books. So every first year at Columbia takes Literature Humanities, which is a class of about 20 students. So there are 60 some odd sections of this class, about 20 students in each section. And the course begins with Homer in September and reads the Odyssey and runs through kind of great books canon uh, of the West all the way to contemporary uh, contemporary works. Um, so you end in the spring semester after a year with the same group of students, same faculty member reading contemporary works. Then a sophomore student do the, students do the same thing, this time though reading philosophical texts beginning with Plato's Republic, uh, followed by Aristotle's Ethics and Politics, uh, biblical, biblical texts, both the Jewish and Christian texts and the Islamic texts, uh, the Quran, uh, running through great works in, in, in philosophical, ethical, political thought, all the way to contemporary works. So those two year long courses that anchor the first and second year of Columbia are kind of the center of the core curriculum. Again, the program has been going for about a hundred years and is, is something that is very much um, in the in the identity, in the DNA of the Columbia College experience and of, of Columbia College alumni. Um, a common challenge is that uh, a lot of professors, and I would include myself in this group, uh, have a, a tradition of liking to hear our own voice. <laughs> yes, and yes. And so um, it's not easy emotionally, I think, and I've worked on this myself, to pull back and make room for right. the students. And I think a lot of people think, oh, well, that gives the, that just gives the students a chance to run their mouths. I don't want to hear them. They don't know anything about Homer. Or you have a professor who's been teaching it for 20 years. Shouldn't that person be explaining it? What's the value of letting the students uh, explore the text rather than being told what's in it? Yeah. So let me say a few things about that. One is that, that we emphasize quite strongly the discussion aspect of the courses. The reason that they are small courses rather than large lectures is so that every student has a chance to participate, so that every student has a chance to engage not only with the instructor, but with each other. Um, it is kind of in the, in the essence of um, the way we conceive of the project in the classroom is a conversation, is discussion. So that is, that is, um, kind of drilled into every instructor that enters into the classroom by every form of communication that we have, including, and perhaps most importantly, that we have faculty meetings every week in which we model that. We have faculty meetings in which we have a guest speaker um, that's an expert in the, in the, in the, in the field, uh, in the book, whatever book is coming up. And, and, and that speaker might give a 20 or 30 minute presentation. And then it's discussion and questions. So that modeling is very important, especially for, for the teachers who are being trained. 
Um, another thing that we do this 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 started while I was there is in in the in something I implemented in the end of semester evaluations. We ask the students to comment and to um, uh, kind of rate the balance between discussion and presentation with the instructor. Um, that's very important because by asking that question, the student evaluation would signal both to the student and to the instructor that this is something that, that matters to us and we, that we want to keep an eye on. Um, one other thing that's very important is that there is no individual who is an expert in the range of material that we teach. Um, if you are a classics professor, you're going to have some expertise in the in the Greek and, and, and Roman classics, but you're going to be in the same boat as everybody else when we're doing the Hebrew Bible, for example, or when you're doing Don Quixote or when you're doing Shakespeare. Um, so the fact that the professor, from the, from, from the foundation, from the premise of the course, the professor doesn't w walk into the classroom as an expert in the field, but as rather rather as a guide to the conversation as a kind of skilled moderator of, of, of discussion, exchange, debate, exploration. Um, so that, that is quite central to the identity of the program to, and, and, and to the way that the classroom is structured. Of course, the other thing that the teacher doesn't bring to the table is sometimes <clears throat> the other thing that, that they don't bring to the table is relevant life experience. I, I, I was talking to a student here at Shalem recently, all of our students, virtually all of them, I think, have served in the Israeli army. And I was asking him, I asked him if he got any value out of reading the Iliad, which mm -hmm. is a brutal, <laughs> very yeah. long, brutal poem. Um, and um, his one sentence answer was, well, yeah, it changed my perspective on what it meant to be a soldier. And I, I think we'll move on, but I, but I think the fundamental misunderstanding of liberal arts education is that it's about the transmission of knowledge right. when in fact it is not. Right. And you start off your quote saying it's not. Right. And I think the idea of an expert at the front of the room explaining something to you or telling you something is a, a necessary model in many fields. Mm -hmm. But when you're exploring a great text or more importantly, an unanswerable question, right? Uh, what you learn from that experience is very different when you discovered for yourself than when someone tells you their answer. Right. It's an answer. Right. And you can see how this model of education, this approach to the educational experience is going to sit uncomfortably in the thrust of the university, which is the model the, of the contemporary university is a research model in which people develop very narrow expertise, very deep expertise, and then build their professional identity by uh, replicating and reproducing that expertise. That is by training um, students on the one hand and by publishing on the other to, uh, to, to advance and, 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 and reproduce that expertise. And that's what we learn in graduate school, even in the humanities. My PhD is in English and comparative literature. And that's what I learned. I learned how to be an expert in, in, in 19th century American intellectual history, which is what I, what I wrote my dissertation on. Um, and then when you step into the liberal arts classroom, you're in an entirely different territory. Um, and very often, if you are going to succeed, if you're going to do the job right, you have to unlearn all of the academic habits that you have been that have been instilled in you in graduate school. So it's a it's a practice within the university. I'm speaking here mainly kind of the research university, Shalem or, or liberal arts college, where um, it's all about liberal education is is, is somewhat different. Um, even though the research ideal dominates, at least in the United States, the the, the profession so thoroughly that 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 to some extent. This obtains even in liberal arts colleges. When you step into the liberal arts classroom, you, you are doing an entirely different sort of activity, one that, it, that it's very interpersonally intense and one in which, as you say, the point is not to arrive at the answers to the questions, but to sharpen our capacity to think through, sit with, examine, debate, hear others on, on these fundamental questions, because they are the fundamental questions of our of our human human existence, uh, questions about justice, about political power, about the meaning of love, the meaning of mortality. Um, you know, we don't know better today what justice is than Plato did, 
Um, and we don't read Plato because it's going to tell us what justice is. We read Plato because he's going to sharpen our capacity to ask the fundamental questions that, that, that are implied by, our, by, by any kind of commitment or aspiration to justice. And the reason your book is so powerful, and um, we're not going to have any spoilers, I don't think, on, on the stories you tell in the book. But the reason the book is so powerful is that you reflect on your own experience, having been a student at Columbia in the core curriculum, having been an immigrant from the Dominican Republic, coming here as a, as a, a young person, and um, how that experience of the core curriculum at Columbia transformed your own life. And a lot of it involves what you call uh, and what we call at Shalem self-scrutiny, mm -hmm. uh, which we'll, we'll talk about. But before we do, I, I, I want to talk about the phrase liberal arts, which I, for fun, uh, said we're the only liberal arts college in Israel. I hate that phrase. I know you don't like <laughs> it either. Uh, it's a terrible uh, – you, you make the observations as obvious for me too that it's not a great marketing phrase. It makes people think it's either about politics or sculpture. <laughs> uh, liberal arts, what the heck is that? Uh, I often call it real education uh -huh. uh, to try to distinguish it from uh, the transmission model recently quoted on this program, the quote from Plutarch. It's sort of a quote, as we talked about in that episode, uh, that the mind is not a um, vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. And that to me is that's a pretty good one sentence description of what we're trying to do here. It leaves out a few things, but it's a start. Um, talk about what's wrong with liberal arts if you want to add anything. Well, it is a problematic phrase and, and, and largely is problematic because it's got baggage associations within the broader culture um, that are kind of are all kind of misnomers or, or misunderstandings. Like, as you said, thinking of liberal and liberal education in, in, in political and in contemporary political terms. Whereas the 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 origin, um, the meaning, it just has to do with freedom. Has to do with with the condition of, of freedom in which we find ourselves as human beings, and in the fact that the education is not subordinated to some specific uh, goal, some spe specific craft. Same goes with art. It's not about about art in the sense that we understand art since probably after the Renaissance uh, as this as this kind of um, autonomous, useless activity. Um, so. Um, there, there are other phrases, real education. Sometimes people just talk about core competencies or sometimes soft skills or general education. Um, sometimes they, 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 they just talk about the humanities, which is yeah. certainly problematic because the, the sciences and, and, and the mathematics and, and, and quantitative um, thinking is, is part of liberal education, the liberal arts. Um, I have not found the inadequate term. So virtually every talk I give, and, and I begin the book this way, I, I have to take a few minutes to talk about the term, to kind of disambiguate um, and, and clear some of the cobwebs that, that prevent people from, from thinking straight about what liberal education is. Um, the one thing about the term that, that, that has prevented me from giving it up is that it's this emphasis on, on the condition of freedom. Um, because the reason why we are subjects, uh, the kind of being that need and, and benefit from a liberal education, is that every human being finds itself in, in, in this condition where we have to posit for ourselves, develop, work out for ourselves some notion of what the human good is, what the, the good after which we want to organize our lives and strive for, toward. Um, no one can do that for you. I mean, you can have traditions. You can have uh, religious, cultural uh, heritage that gives you some pointers and some guidance, some framework. But you have to somehow work out for yourself what those um, end goals are that are going to give your life meaning, that you're going to strive forward to make some kind of um, uh, satisfying uh, life, to give meaning. So, so that, that, that task that is inevitable and, and uh, you know, ineluctable for every, every individual embodies, expresses our condition of freedom. And liberal education addresses itself to that. Um, so problematic term, and I, I, I hope that someone gives me a better one. I, um, when, when my book, um, after I wrote the book and, and we're kind of finalizing it, I could not come up with a title. And, and I, I asked the editors at the press, please come up with a title for this book because I'm, I'm, I'm stumped here. But 
I hope that it has the word liberal education in the title. Well, the title came back, does not have liberal education in the title. <laughs> But Rescuing Socrates is a beautiful title because it's a reference. It's a double entendre. It's yep. Rescuing Socrates as a thinker from the ash bin of history and Socrates himself uh, under the death penalty needed rescuing, chose not to be rescued. And that's a, you have a wonderful discussion of that ethical quandary or wasn't much of a quandary for him. He was pretty decided that he was going to take his poison and accept his fate. But of course, he's immortal. He never did die, and uh, you've rescued him one more time for the rest of us. Um, just as an aside, I would mention that um, I, many of our listeners will know the Hebrew word shalom, which means peace. The word shalem, which is a, comes from the same root, uh, means whole, W-H-O-L-E, hmm. complete, hmm. In, uh, entire. And, of course, it's an aspiration, not a... A, a real goal. We're not telling people where they're they're going, or that when you're done here, you'll be whole. But it's about the goal is to lead a full life, right. a whole life as a full human being. Right. And I just want to pick on my uh, my own discipline of economics. You know, economists say, "Well, it's easy to live. You just maximize your utility." Uh, you just, and of course, that often, it, to my horror, becomes just more stuff, the better. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think in many ways, real education is, is appreciating that maybe that's not the only goal in life. Yeah. I mean, this issue of wholeness, I, I did, didn't know that, but it's, it's beautiful um, because part of what managing this condition of freedom in which we find ourselves consists of is somehow integrating the conflicting psychic forces that, that, that we're subject to, um, our kind of desire structure. We, we sincerely, wholeheartedly desire absolutely contradictory and incompatible things. You know, we want, to, uh, we want to be fit, but we don't want to work out. And we want both of those sincerely, um, uh, genuinely. And our lives is, is shot through with similar incompatibilities of desire. And part of living a whole life is finding a way to integrate, finding a way to uh, bring some kind of wholeness to that to that um, to that inner life, and uh, that's where well-being comes from. That's what those are the that's the condition for thriving, for fully developing our humanity, uh, and it's quite disconnected from economic goods. Um, I mean, we need obviously some uh, economic goods to 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 make that even possible, but that that threshold is 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 uh, you know it's it's a very modest threshold beyond which the questions that determine your well-being are no longer um, a function of, of material, uh, you know, material goods, but but enter some kind of different dimension, and uh, that 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 have to do with this condition of freedom, um, and that's what liberal arts tries tries to 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 get at and to educate. Um, the very tricky thing, um, you know, how what is the best kind of education for an individual? Um, th that is faced with this internal um, configuration. And of course, that is in a community of people similarly constituted. Um, those, are the, those are the issues to which liberal education addresses itself. Well, one might argue, I wouldn't, but I'll pretend for a minute, put on a different hat. Now, this liberal arts education thing, a whole life, fulfillment, you didn't mention human flourishing, a phrase I like, but it's a different way to describe what you're talking about. If you want to be pretentious, you use the Greek word eudaimonia, which I don't know how to pronounce, but that's, you get the idea. I mean, that's just, first of all, self-scrutiny, come on. For $60,000 a year plus opportunity cost, you're going to let people read these old books and what, get, discover themselves? I mean, don't they need to find a job? I mean, this is way... Uh, out of line for the bang for the buck. And it's a nice thing for maybe a summer on your own, read some of these books. But you're telling me that this is a worthwhile expenditure and, and at a state college, you, you know, you're spending uh, government money to indulge in this kind of highfalutin philosophical quest. Come on. Yeah. Can you, you know, there's defend a line. that? Really? Yeah, there's... Uh, yeah, there's a line in, uh, in in King Lear where King Lear is asking for 
I think it's a number of knights or horses that he wants his retinue to continue. And, and, and the, the, the daughters, you know, the, the bad daughters, are like, no, you don't need 100. You don't need 50. And he says, reason not the need. Um, the things that constitute our humanity and that give us uh, a life worth living are not about the needs. Um, and yes, it is the most worthwhile pursuit for each one of us to examine ourselves and the world in, in the quest for this kind of wholeness. Now, one common misconception is that a liberal arts education gives you that instead of the right. skills to have a job. And that's not it at all. I mean, we, the university, higher education has a, I think, a moral imperative to equip our students to go out and, and be productive members of society, to be able to find a job, to be able to make a living, to be able to contribute to society in, in, in meaningful ways. That's part of our responsibility. The problem is that in the contemporary world, that aspect of liberal education has swallowed the whole. That is that we have done that and forgotten about this other responsibility that we have, which is to educate free individuals, right? There is an education that's about how to do a job, how to accomplish something, how to do what you're told, how to be a member in a often hierarchical, industrial, or productive organization. That's a kind of education that, 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 that the ancients used to call a uh, slave education. Um, and there's another aspect of education that's a free education for the free person. Um, and in our, in, our, in our economic structure, we both, both of, do both of those things. There are aspects of my life in which I am um, subject to procedures, to, to institutions, to you know, credentialing system, in my, in my case, in higher education. And I performed those functions. And my, my education prepared me for that. Then there is this other aspect of my life. Um, that is not entirely separate because the way in which I perform those, um, those kind of determinate functions is, is, is informed and shaped by this other thing, which is how do I conceive of myself as an individual? What, what drives me? What, where do I get meaning? What do I do with my life once my basic needs have been met? Um, you know, the, the way that W.E.B. Du Bois, the great... African American intellectual put it is that 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 the college is not uh, just about how to uh, earn a living. How to uh, the true college it says um, it's not just about what to uh, how to make a living, but but what knowing what to do with that life, um, not just for earning bread, but to know what to do with the life that bread sustains. Um, so that's what liberal education is, and and I I, I go around talking. In many many schools, many audiences, and and one thing I've come to, I've kind of gotten around to emphasizing is that I am not there arguing for the liberal arts major. You know, in the American university, you choose a major as an undergraduate, and uh, art history, literature, philosophy, those majors have been precipitously declining, and there's a kind of panic among faculty and institutions about the decline of the humanities major. And, and sometimes they confuse what I'm talking about in arguing for liberal education with arguing for, for liberal arts major, which, which I'm not. Um, liberal arts major is great. I was a liberal arts major, I teach liberal arts majors, but that's not what, that's not the point that I think our universities are, are feeling in and the point which I think is a kind of critical for sustaining a democracy. What we need in a higher education institution within a democratic society is liberal education for all. You can be a computer scientist, you can be a doctor, you can be a business person, you can be whatever you'd like, but that should be on top of a liberal education. And that's the Columbia model, the core curriculum to start with. You don't spend the rest of your time doing more philosophy and literature and and um, music and art and so on. You specialize in something. Um, so you you pick four thinkers who've had a big influence on your life. You picked um, Freud, Gandhi, Plato, Socrates via Plato, and um, Augustine or Augustine. We've decided before we recorded this that we could 
each of us could use either one interchangeably. So that's right. If anybody else knows better, let us know. We'll be happy to correct it in the future. Uh, you picked four people. Now, I assume you could have picked eight. You could have picked twelve. It's some number at which, at some point, at which you'd, you'd have, you could name a book that I, you could at least remember its impact on you or thinker. And what's fun about this for me is that other people who were your classmates would pick different books and different thinkers. And as you know, we bring our own experience to the table and then we internalize the knowledge we're trying to explore in that seminar and uh, we, we fashion something out of it. We, um, uh, we, we craft, as you say, we craft ourselves. Um, and um, why these four for you? Without telling the whole story of the book, I, I recommend yeah. it. It's yeah. fascinating. But w w what's special about these four for you in a, yeah. in a, thumbnail, in a thumbnail? There, there are two, at least two, two big ways in which these four ended, two big reasons why these four ended up there. One is completely idiosyncratic. Um, these four writers happen to have had a huge impact on me when I read them and have continued to kind of shape the way I, I live my life, the way I think about my life, the way that, that I, the way that I teach, I continue to teach these writers, uh, you know, take, take St. Augustine, the first, the first writer that I, that I deal with. I encountered St. Augustine in my freshman year at Columbia, a time that was hugely challenging for me, kind of I was disorienting in, in, in the most profound ways. Um, I was trying to work out my own kind of relationship with religion, with God, with Christianity, with the intellectual life that I was that I was beginning on um, as as a as a student, um, and Augustine fell on very fertile ground for me. It was intellectually transformative. Kind of, you know, you talked about that 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 line where the the mind is a not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be lit. Saint Augustine lit me, put me on fire. Um, and um, he's a very devout and, and and deep religious thinker. What he did for me was not make me uh, more of a Christian like he would have liked, uh, but rather it made me less of a Christian, but more of an intellectual. Uh, but I, I know people for whom St. Augustine did the opposite. I was having a, a conversation with, with a philosopher um, the other day where she also encountered St. Augustine as a freshman uh, in college and uh, ended up being a Catholic, converting to Catholicism because of the influence St. Augustine had on her. Um, so these books uh, had profound um, formative impact when I read them. Um, so in that way, it's kind of idiosyncratic. And as you said, uh, a different student or me at a different stage in my life might have had other other of the writers I encountered have this kind of decisive decisive impact. Um, so that that that's one way. In one way, it is it is idiosyncratic. There's another way in which they are also exemplary. They're exemplary in, 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 I'll mention two ways in which they're exemplary. One is that these are, are works that I think work very, very well for the purposes of liberal education. That is, these are the kinds of books, the, kind, the kinds of intellectual stimuli provocations that I think um, are, are ideal for the liberal arts classroom. Um, they are books that are rich, consequential, human, um, enduring, um, kind of timeless. So that's one way in which they, they are a model for the kinds of works that I think are most conducive to the project of liberal education. Another way in which they're a model is that these are books, even though I'm a scholar, I'm a, I'm a professor, um, uh, these are books in which I don't have scholarly expertise. Um, I don't read Latin, I don't read Greek, I don't read Gujarati, I don't read German, I don't know the scholarship. I mean, I have some, some kind of uh, uh, generalist encounter with some of the scholarship, but I'm not a specialist in these and I'm not writing about them and I don't teach them as a specialist, as a scholarly authority, but I teach them and write about them as a human being whose life is illuminated by the ideas, the debates, the provocations that these writers put forth. Um, and that any individual who is uh, similarly interested, similarly alert, um, can be impacted in this way by these books without the scholarly apparatus, without the kind of um, elaboration that these 
works have received in the in the traditional academy. You say anybody can be influenced by them. You know, I'm going to make a confession. Don't tell anybody it on the board of Shalom, okay? It's just between okay. you and me, Roosevelt, okay? okay? And anybody who's listening, could you just, if everybody would agree, it would, I'd really appreciate it. But I've never read Freud. Uh, my dad had a master's in psychology that poisoned psychology for him for, the, for his mm -hmm. entire life. And he told me it was a waste of time. And I believed him for a long time. I've since realized that, that I was, there's something there I'd be thinking about. Uh, but I never read Freud. And a lot of people would say, Freud, oh, come on. He had those kooky theories about our drives, our ego. Uh, it's out of date. He was, but he's been disproved. You know, he's silly. He's a waste of time. Nobody should read Freud. It's silly. Um, I've never read uh, – I've read a little Gandhi, uh -huh. uh, I should say. I was going to say <laughs> I read a guy, but I, I, I have read a little bit. Uh, I've read very little Plato. I've read a few dialogues. Uh -huh. And I've never read um, St. Augustine. Uh -huh. And so I want, I want to challenge you. I want to ask you two questions. One is some of the lessons that you bring out, and they're really quite, quite fascinating for your own life and how they influenced you. You could learn them from other thinkers. The, 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 the questions they raise and the answers are not questions with answers, but the, answer, the, the way you cope with those questions in your life. You can find other thinkers. Uh, I suspect mm -hmm. for some or many of the questions they raise. And the other question, so, so that, is that true? And then the second question I would ask is, uh, you know, after reading your book, one of the things that I wanted to do was to run out and read some Freud because I thought, oh, my gosh, <laughs> this is so interesting. Uh, and it has nothing to do with, you know, weird things about my mom. I'll just <laughs> leave, that, leave that there. Um, and yet you were transformed. You were cultivated. You were lit on fire by encountering those books in this weird formal seminar system that we've been, that we started off talking about. It's not easy to pick them up and read them on your own. Now, a yeah. good education teaches you how to read and teaches you how to ask your own questions and puts you in the, I, I like to think in a, in a, in a way for a lifetime of, of exploration, but it's hard. It's really yeah. hard. So talk yeah. about those two issues. Um, yeah. Can other thinkers provoke some of the same issues? And secondly, uh, can you do it on your own? Yeah. Um, well, Russ, you, you're in for a treat when you get to read Freud. Um, one thing about Freud is that he's a, he's a great writer. He is engaging. Now, don't read his technical stuff, you know, the clinical papers, et cetera. You can read some of the case studies, which he wrote for a general audience. Just a fascinating, provocative writer who relishes scandalizing uh, uh, kind of conventional wisdom and conventional thoughts. And some, he's, he's wrong plenty of times so that it's, it, we, you don't read him because he's going to, you know, solve all the questions for you. But boy, um, he's a, he, he, he's a fun writer to, to read. Um, I, I just want to interject. Yeah, yeah. I just want to interject that for, for recent listeners, uh, if Tyler Cowen were here, he'd say you have to read him in French, but uh, you're saying I can read him in <laughs> It's an inside joke for you kind of talk listeners. I'll explain it later, Roosevelt, but uh, when we're off the air, but but I can read them in English, right? I don't have to learn yes, German. Yes, you can, read, it, you can read them in English. Okay, yeah. good. Thank you. Um, you know, and where German should I start? Line. Where should I start? Where should, well, I would start with the, with the text that I dis discussed the most in the book, which is his in the five lectures on psychoanalysis, which we gave, he gave in his only visit to America as a kind of general overview of the psychoanalytic method and the major concepts and and, and procedures uh, significance of psychoanalysis. Um, that it's, it's a very accessible, lovely, short um, little book. So that's 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 where I would begin. And if you're interested, there's there's a lot more. Um, but to your questions, let me just first say that that Freud indeed has been kind of discredited in in in, in large parts of his of his. Uh, theories and, and claims that he made um, and, and, and virtually ignored in, in, in clinical psychology today directly. Yet um, he's hugely influential um, even among people who've never read Freud or, or um, it's kind of like Marx, right? Marx kind of discredited as a, as a political force, but boy, Marx pervades the way that, that we think about the world and especially in the academy. So Freud is similarly enormously influential beyond the kind of specific claims that he made and uh, about, about the nature of particularly clinical practice. Um, 
But yes, these books um, are um, not not the only books from which people can get this kind of, of stimulation and, and, and illumination. Um, we're lucky that we have a tradition um, of, of classics or of major thinkers. We have a wealth of texts um, so that you know, the kind of curriculum that you might do at Shalem College is going to be different than the kind of curriculum you do at, you know, at um, uh, a liberal arts college in China. And there are su such experiments um, in China or the ones or what you would do in Latin America or indeed what you do in the U.S. Um, there is a, a, a huge wealth of texts that that I think serve the purpose of liberal education. Um, so indeed, these are not the only texts. They are models. They are exemplary. Uh, but I don't, you know, will you be handicapped if you organize a liberal education curriculum that doesn't have Freud in it or that doesn't have Gandhi? Uh, no, you wouldn't be. Um, I think they're very good. Um, I'd recommend them. Um, but but you would not be, um, they're not kind of irreplaceable. Plato might be irreplaceable if you're doing the Western tradition because he's so foundational. He's so um, at, at the bottom of so many of the questions and issues that all of philosophy and political thought have continued to grapple, grapple with. Um, are these texts accessible on your own? I think I have a mixed answer to that. Um, yes, you can, you can pick up the dialogues of Plato, read them profitably on your own. Um, but liberal education, in my view, is something that happens between people. And it's actually something that Plato would agree with. Uh, the, uh, there's a little, a little um, dialogue that Plato writes called the Phaedrus in which he condemns writing. And it's, you know, writing a, a book just keeps saying the same things over and over again. And if you ask it a question, it doesn't answer. It just repeats again and again. You need for philosophical development, you need a live uh, kind of kicking and objecting and responding individual. Uh, so a deep insight in that, where liberal education involves dialogue, involves debate, involves shared exploration. The books are an occasion to do that. They're they are a platform, a vehicle to facilitate that kind of dialogue. So while they are profitably read individually, um, it seems to me that you would be missing a lot um, if you if it stays there, if it doesn't become an occasion for dialogue and exchange. So what I always suggest is if you're interested in this text, you're not a student, you're not in school, and you, you, you can't uh, you know, sign up for something online or join a discussion group, find one person that's going to read this one book with you and you know, go have dinner, go have coffee, and discuss the ideas, discuss the passages that struck you, discuss the, the, what it made you think about what questions it, it raised for you. What do other people think the other person thinks about those questions? This kind of dialogic process of exploration, of debate, of, of consideration of the, of the great issues, that's, where, uh, that's kind of where the meat of liberal education lies. So yes, accessible the books, uh, much more profitably uh, taken in as part of uh, a conversation. I like to think that's what Econ Talk tries to do. You and I are having a conversation. The listener, my happiest moment is when the listener says, you asked just the question I was going to ask. And it allows the, the listener to be more than a fly on the wall and ideally uh, an active participant to the extent it's possible in, in this modern medium. But it's um, – I think dialogue and conversation are, are very powerful. And as I get older, I appreciate you know more and more – what they do. I want to challenge something and you that said. That, of course, gets us, um, just a, a quick comment, that gets us back to the question we raised, you raised earlier about the classroom, the liberal arts classroom being conversation driven. Um, it is not knowledge of the works, but debate and grappling with the questions that the works raise. Um, yeah. You know, sometimes you think of a novel. The thing that you get out of a novel is not knowledge of the novel, it's a certain experience, certain aesthetic moral, discursive immersion that you experience in reading the novel. That's why you can't just tell somebody the plot, the tell plot, somebody yeah. the story. And <laughs> that, that won't do it because it's not knowledge of the story, but the experience of going through the story that does the work of literature. Great example. I, I want to challenge your claim about foundational, about Plato. I wouldn't disagree that Plato's foundational. What I want to disagree with is 
is whether that's important. So mm -hmm. here at Shalom, you know, our students, we like to think, learn the best of Athens and Jerusalem. They learn their uh, Western heritage of Plato, Shakespeare, Aristotle, and so on. And then they learn their Jewish heritage, whether religious or not. We, we read them. You don't read Homer to find out how many gods there are. And you can read the Hebrew Bible with profit, if, even if you're a believer, even if you're not a believer. They're interesting, deep questions. Questions And obviously, who we are in, say, in America or in Israel and many other places in the world, the Hebrew Bible is part of that evolution uh, of our, our cultural heritage and canon and in some sense made us – made the water we swim in is the way I would describe mm -hmm. it, even if you don't mm -hmm. know uh, much about how that water got – where it came from. Do you need to know? I mean, it's, it's kind of cool, right? It, it's nice to know – you know, I like to say our students figure they learn where they came from and then they can decide where they want to go. The yeah. alternative view, and this would be true, by the way, about your own personal life, not your heritage as a citizen, say, of the West or a particular nation, East or West. Um, it's like saying, you know, OK, sure, my parents had an influence on me and maybe my religion had something to do with how I was raised or my lack of religion. But I'm my own person. I'm free to be who I want. I'm a blank slate. I can write my own future. I can aspire to be whole in my own way. I don't need to know any of that stuff of where I came from. How do you, how do you answer that claim? Yeah. Um, two things. One is there is a um, – you can't do it on your own. The language that you speak, the, the, the water in which you swim, as you said, it's not one that you made yourself, and, and you're, you're constrained by that. Um, so it is it – is, uh, kind of impossible to do it on your own. That, that's not to say that you have to go and get a formal education. Um, the kind of self-reflective exploration of the human good that a liberal arts education promotes um, can be had outside of academia, outside reading. You know, I grew up, I grew up in a, until I was 12 in a, in a kind of rural little town in the Dominican Republic. And I knew a lot of people who were illiterate. Um, there were people all around me who, who you know, peasants, uh, people in the, from the mountains, or even people in my own little town, um, they were illiterate. And some of those people had what I would think of as a liberal education, people who were thoughtful, uh, wise, um, deliberative kind of thinkers, uh, intellectual, um, in a way that 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 I can only describe as, as as the same kind of 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 quality that a liberal education tries to foster. Um, so it, it's not the case that you need to read Plato in order in order to be liberally educated. But the question is, if you are going to create an institution whose mission or part of its mission is to give a liberal education, is to foster the kind of habits, um, analytical disposition, kind of tools for kind of integrative thinking. Um, how do you do that? What is the best way to do it? And I know of no better way curricularly now I'm talking, right? The way that you, that, that you actualize this ideal in an institution. I know of no better way than this kind of grappling, reading, discussing works that have a, uh, have proven, have a, a, a kind of track record of stimulating and enriching just this kind of thinking, literary works, philosophical works. Um, I know of no better way of kind of executing a liberal education than organizing discussions and instruction around these books, many of, many of which are ancient. And, and part of their importance is precisely that they're ancient and are so foundational, so, so, so foundational, so in the DNA of our culture. I just want to mention, uh, I'm going to give a tentative plug because I don't know enough about it, but Zena Hitz, uh, past econ talk guest, uh, has a project online called The Catherine Project that tries to give people access to these books in a social setting for conversation. Um, and I do want to emphasize that I think a lot of people when they hear a conversation think, oh, I got to listen to other people's opinions. Not so much about opinions. It's about working together in a group trying to understand something that is a little bit 
hard to understand, which is why it's helpful right. to do it in a group. Um, uh, coming back to Freud for a minute, I, my, my answer to the to the person who who says, "What do I need all this old stuff for?" You know, I'm I'm my own person. I'm free to form myself. Oh, you know, sure, there might be some stuff that influenced me, but and I think the project of the examined life, which is the Socratic project, is understanding how hard that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To form yourself without reference to how you came, how you're raised, yeah. where you came from, what your parents did to you, uh, what your religion or lack of it was, what your country was about, the culture you grew up in, the media you watched. Um, you say at one point, uh, and so so I would say that that person is living under an illusion, uh, yeah. and 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 by examining where they came from, they will learn things about both themselves and the world around them, their own community and their culture that they would not otherwise see. Yeah, you're they might right. even learn where this impulse to make yourself all by yourself comes from. <laughs> <laughs> because no, that a, is a culturally constructed ideal um, that, that, that many that's people not don't in every hold. culture at every yeah. time. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I thought about myself. Come on. I mean, it's easy. I, I know I did. He's uh, very relevant. You say, Freud alerted me to the fact that my own mind was not the transparent self I had always taken it to be, but rather a kind of terra incognita a place full of mysteries and shadowy arrangements that despite their invisibility conditioned my personality. As that perception matured and deepened, my own mind became the overriding subject of study in and outside of the classroom. Uh, the other thing I would just raise is that uh, two issues again, I apologize, I asked you two questions at once, but you know, these people that we're talking about, they're dead. Uh, most of them are white, not all of them, but a lot of them are white. Uh, they all happen to be men. I'm sure you got some pushback from your editor for can't you, can't you put a woman in there? Was My like, oh, wife was the one who got who uh, gave uh -huh. me the most pushback about that. Reasonable. It's a good question. I, yeah, I, it is, it, it's somewhat. Um, some would find it disturbing, uh, but certainly in the core curriculum historically, and we'll talk about the modern version of it in a little bit, maybe. But historically, it's it's mainly dead white males because dead white mm -hmm. males were for better or for worse, the people who wrote the books that endured because for all kinds of reasons, right. um, just a fact. Um, it could be an injustice, but it's a fact. And and so, what, isn't there something better to read? I mean, these things are, can I read something today? Can I read something more like me if I'm not a, a male, not white? But, well, and a lot of people, of course, have, have been very critical of the kind of great books canon uh, right. for its exclusivity, not exclusivity in the usual sense, or but that it excludes uh, uh, people of color, women, other issues, obviously are relevant. Um, what? Why should, yeah. How, how do you defend that? I mean, and, and more yeah. just on the most narrow grounds. Why am I reading these people? Have have we learned something between since all yeah. these people lived a yeah. long time ago? The issue of of diversity often gets kind of conflated with related but not identical issue of kind of chronological ordering. So that um, certainly there are works that take my own kind of biographical situatedness. I'm a, a Latino ma immigrant to the United States. There's a wealth of literature, both philosophical, reflective, literary, uh, that, that, that that looks at that and, and 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 reflects on it and that I find you know delicious and stimulating uh, etc um, and if we wanted to construct a canon that reflected the contemporary diversity of our society we could do that but that is going to mean roughly a contemporary canon um, and if you are going to value another kind of diversity that you might think of as chronological diversity, that is where you want not only to see what has been thought and debated and, 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 and pondered in the last 50 years, but you want to know what has been thought and pondered and debated in the last 3,000 years, um, then you're going to lose a certain kind of contemporary diversity when you include that kind of diversity. And my, my argument is that you want to have both of those things in your curriculum. Um, there is nothing exclusionary about the fact that ancient texts are 
written primarily by males. That is, there's only exclusionary to the to to the contemporary diversity. It, it is not there. It is not that 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 um, it is not that that we have decided that we're only going to pick the male writers from the past. Right? That would be the kind of that would be exclusionary in the sense that I'm using the word. Uh, no, the the writers that 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 are there in the past, the people that had access to the tools of intellectual creation were male for all kinds of reasons, unjust reasons, um, reasons that we would not defend today, reasons that we would that we have rejected and, and that therefore we live in a different world. Um, yet there is some other value to that. And one of those great values is that we can see in those ancient texts um, in those in those minds and writers from a different world, a different time, a different class, a different culture than our own, we can see what is fundamentally human. Uh, that I can read Homer, that I can read Plato, and recognize myself in Homer and in Plato, even if I'm a woman. Um, that is extraordinary, and it tells you something about kind of the fundamental architecture of the human experience that nothing in the contemporary world can tell you, nothing that reflects your own historicity, culturally specific signature, nothing that reflects that can illuminate the kind of substratum level humanity that these ancient and alien texts can do. Of course, that's also why it's valuable to read texts from different cultures. The fact that I can read Lao Tzu or Confucius or the Bhagavad Gita and find myself so... Uh, uh, clearly, luminously um, reflected, tells me something uh, about me and about what it means to be human that nothing, nothing else can, nothing contemporary, nothing that reflects my lived experience as an immigrant in the United States can. Um, so, so you need both of those things. And the point of a, of a curriculum, um, of a full liberal arts curriculum is to be able to span that uh, that range. Now, obviously, every curriculum is going to have to make hard choices because we have limited time. Um, but I think judicious choices and very effective, kind of outstandingly effective curricula can be uh, can be put together that capture both things. I like to point out that if you read a book a week and you read for fifty years, you'll read about twenty five hundred books in your lifetime. So pick them carefully. It's not a very big number. Um, you know, there are those of us who read a lot more than that, but 5,000 would still be a small number. If you read twice yeah. as many, if you read two books a week um, and or for more than 50 years, if you're, if you're blessed to live, you know, to live longer. Uh, and, you know, to many, make those kinds of decisions, traditions are extraordinarily valuable. Traditions collect a kind of, they express a kind of collective intelligence, a kind of generation after generation that have, that have read thousands and thousands of books and, 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 and they have made this selection for you. You don't have to agree, but it's a great place from which to start. Just a side comment about translation. All of these books that we're talking about, certainly the last ones you mentioned from uh, Eastern or uh, culture, they're not written in English. We read them. Uh, we mentioned Freud earlier, but he wasn't written poetry, but certainly for Homer, we're reading him in translation. Um, until the Fagel's translation of Homer, I never got a lot out of it. Um, the mm -hmm. Fagel's translation is so good, and I've not read the newer ones. Emily Watson has one that uh -huh. it's received a lot of acclaim. But the Fagel's one is so good. I used to read it out loud to my small children. And I encourage those of you who are parents out there, um, you can read the Odyssey. The Iliad's a little bit violent. Um, but you can read – and so is the Odyssey, of course. But you, you can read the Odyssey profitably to – you can keep your kids spellbound. You, you may need to explain a few of the poetic twists of phrase and, and the some of the sentences are a little, might be a little bit convoluted. And you might have to go back and read them again and, and talk about them. But it, it's like reading one of the greatest adventure stories of all time. Now, you could read a different adventure story. There's plenty of them, modern ones, as we're talking about. Um, Homer's is really good. It stood, you know, the mm -hmm. way I would answer it as an economist is it stood the test of time. And it's not because people just had a religious desire to read Homer, although you could argue right. you should because it's part of who we are. Um, you know, the the scene where Homer, where, excuse me, where Odysseus comes home to find um, 108 or so suitors uh, chasing his wife and her money because they think he's dead and um, manages to, with the help of his son to 
I think Kell All 108 is like the beginning of the Avengers, uh, <laughs> the standard movie trope where yeah. a small band yeah. of courageous people maybe overcome odds. And it's an old trope. And, and yeah. you know, it's it's powerful to read it in that in that old in that old version. But what I was going to say, I got off track, is that I'm reading it in translation. And if I picked up the Fitzgerald translation of, of Homer today, I'd struggle to be moved by it. So mm-hmm. if you want. Talk about that, about translation, and mm-hmm. um, and whether you agree with me about the test of time, and all that. I think it's yeah. probably what you were you were saying beforehand, yeah. anyway. Yeah, I think the, the the problem of translation, if you want to say, if you want to put it that way, it's a great it's a great kind of entry point into a certain kind of education and awareness of the way that language works. Um, so I encourage people, you know, there, there there's a kind of different levels of interest. There's there's probably a level of interest. You just want to read the book and, and, and talk about it. Um, if the book really, really catches your attention, you may want to go to a, a, another layer. And that might involve picking up a couple of translations and, and, and looking at them and see why they're different or how they differ and which ones move you and which ones don't move you. Um, a third level might be to look into some of like the key terms. Um, so, you know, you mentioned the term idomenia before, which is central to Aristotle's ethics. And that term is often translated as happiness. But um, when you dig around a little bit, you realize that maybe human flourishing is a better is a is a better translation. Although it's not as it's not a common thing. We all, we're always talking about being happy. We rarely talk about flourishing, which is a very kind of metaphorical. Um, but you you might you you and then like does the term happiness or flourishing in Aristotle? How does that compare to the to the to the say? Uh, Sanskrit terms that, that are kind of cognates like, you know, nirvana um, and, or um, enlightenment. Um, and you, you can get at this, at, this, at this very profound kind of truths about human experience by doing this kind of linguistic analysis that is conscious of trans, translation problems. Um, that is translation problems, the, the sometimes untranslatability of terms, it's a way of shedding light on the complexity of certain notions, on the historical constructiveness of certain notions in the way that we don't have certain words in this language, that to say something that you say with one word in a different language, you need several and you never kind of get it right. I think that kind of meta-awareness of the linguistic reality and medium in which we live is extraordinarily valuable as, uh, in education. And it's one of the reasons why this, the study of foreign language, something that, you know, you live, living in Israel, you live in a world that's kind of linguistically and traditionally complex in a way that in America we don't. Most people in America are just, you know, English only and have only a, a very vague sense of what it means to know and speak a different language. So that is extraordinarily enriching that the, the problems of, of translation. And I think that, that they belong in the kind of reflection that you do about the great works. I want to recommend a few books that that brings to mind. Um, George Steiner, who's not well known, uh, wrote two books that I really enjoyed. One I read completely, the other I'm in the middle of. I've alluded to one of them before. He wrote a book called Errata, E-R-R-A-T-A, meaning like mistakes. It's a, it's a memoir, but it has one of the most extraordinary passages of what it's like to read the Iliad. Um, he talks about being a little boy and his father is reading him a, from a big dramatic scene. And then his father says, oh, 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 the translation here, it ends. And it made some mistake. I think a page fell out. He goes, do you want to try to read the original Greek and we'll, we'll work our way through it? And, and George Steiner's like, I think he's like eight or 10. And he's, of course, yes, yes. He's dying to find out what happens, uh, whether Achilles is going to kill this guy who he's got wow. at his mercy. And um, I won't spoil the, what happens uh, in the scene or with um, George Steiner, but it's really, it's very deeply moving about the power of education, especially at a young age, to to open your mind to the richness of the human experience, a lot of what we've been talking about. But he has another book. He talks about some of these issues in Arada, but he has another book called After Babel, where he – talking about the Tower of Babel, where yeah. he defends – he defends multiplicity of languages, which is a crazy idea, right? You know, like you'd think what would be better than if everybody could talk with the same language? And he actually yeah. in this book first talks about how translation's not just a foreign language problem but a 
same language problem because uh-huh. over time as languages evolve what you yeah. think a word means doesn't mean that anymore that's yeah, you know unbelievable right. so right. it's that's a fascinating fascinating book but the other book i want to recommend which i mentioned very briefly before you know, I did an episode with uh, Richard Gunderman on Tolstoy's Master and Man, which is, I think, mm-hmm. one of the one of my five favorite short stories of all wow. time. A mind blowing story. Yeah. And many people went and read it. From who are listening, uh, you can find it online. Uh, but the, I found it in a book by George Sanders, which is a masterpiece. The book, it, his book is called A Swim in a Pond in the Rain, where he takes different Russian short stories, Chekhov, Tolstoy. Uh, and others, and he and Gogol and others, and he riffs on them. And the way he riffs on them is very, very powerful because what he's trying to do in there is give you the experience of sitting in his classroom and doing exactly what you and I are mm-hmm. talking about, which mm-hmm. is to to recreate in a two dimensional form, but it's the best you can do in a right, book. Right. Something of what you would start to think about, the questions you might yeah. be asked, and how you would struggle to answer them in a great seminar. And um, if you're thirsty for the kind of experience that when I describe Shalem, and I'm sure when people read your book, they go, oh, I, w- I want to study that. I want to be, a- I want to come to Columbia, or I want to come to Shalem. And um, that book by George Sanders gives you the flavor of what it's like without you having to travel. So you, and that's you the, might, the pond. What was the title of that swim, book? A, a swim, swim in a pond in the rain. Not a great title. Swim hard to remember. I yeah. think it's Chekhov's short story. Um, okay. I never okay. liked Chekhov until I read that book. That book yeah. really got me interested in Chekhov. And I didn't know that particular Tolstoy story. And it yeah. got me interested in some amazing Tolstoy stories, um, which are which are just, they're very, very, um, they make you think, which is yeah. a lot of yeah. uh, what we're talking about. But, I don't know but what, yeah. But what Sanders does is, as the book goes on, he starts to give you, he goes deeper and deeper in his sort of exegesis of these stories, and he starts to show you different translations of uh-huh. a sentence in, say, Alyosha the Pot by Tolstoy. And he shows you how how you might think of the character of Alyosha could change just because he picked a slightly different word. And it's right. very, very, right. he gets at what you're talking about. It's a long-winded right. answer. Right. response to your comment that once you experience a foreign language, it really changes or living in a foreign culture as, as you did as a boy and as I'm doing here in Israel, language wise, you're forced to realize that the both your brain and your speaking and the language, which is so natural to you, is actually kind of funky and, and right. not right. so reliable. <laughs> right. Not what you and think it is. You know, invaluable. It's invaluable that the, the, the the light that that sheds on the experience of your own mind, it's, uh, it's, it's priceless. Um, and that's, it seems to me that a, a liberal education ought to include language instruction, um, foreign language instruction, that it ought to expand your kind of linguistic range in this fundamental way. Um, exposure to a foreign language is one of the things that in, in, in American higher education, it's just, it's being lost increasingly fewer and fewer universities are including second language or foreign language um, as part of the general education. It's, and it's, it's, it's tragic. And I, uh, I love that idea of, of celebrating and preserving and, and advancing a multiplicity of language. And sure, we can have one lingua franca, we can have, you know, a, a language of broader communication, but 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 um, fostering linguistic specificity just seems to me so, so valuable, such a treasure that 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 we have that that's really worth worth preserving. My wife and I were sitting in a restaurant last night and I wanted a napkin. And the waiter came by and I said, Mapit Bavakasha, which means napkin, a napkin, please. And I was so excited because I didn't think I want a napkin. What's the Hebrew word for na- Oh, Mapit. And I said it. It came out unprovoked. Wow. Now, is that an illusion of what that process is like? I mean, what's when I say napkin, is it any different? <laughs> Am I really yeah. just going, I want the white thing that I sometimes – what is – oh, that's a napkin. Could I have a napkin, please? Yeah. And is it just faster now because I've been here a while or is it something else going on there? And yeah. you do sort of see your mind. It allows you – and I think a lot of what we're talking about, uh, certainly the Freud, it, it allows you to step outside yourself 
and look down on yourself in a Smithian impartial observer way, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is one of the most powerful things a person can do. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it doesn't come naturally at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, what comes naturally is just getting through life every day. And when you can step outside yourself and realize, yes. oh my gosh, that person yes. who just said that or made that face or forgot to do that thing, oh, that's a kind of sad. Oh, well, that's yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Conscious self-reflection. Um, and it, and it in, that capacity imbues the world with interest. Um, you know, one of the great benefits that a liberal education confers on you is that it makes the world so, so interesting. Uh, it, it, it just, it becomes very hard to be bored um, because everything around you, including your own mind is so, uh, it's so full of, 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 of noteworthy, puzzling, interesting things. And I guess that's the work of my limited knowledge of Montagna, which is, I don't know if even if I'm saying yes. his name correctly, but Montagna was the person who you know, basically said, you know what the most interesting to study is? It's me. <laughs> That's right. I study myself, he says, more than any other subject. This is my physics. This is my metaphysics, he says. <laughs> and he was onto something. Uh, and yes. he, he can be read very profitably on, on your own. Um, yeah. I, was, I, I lost my train of thought again. I want to add a quick thing. Um, oh, yeah. So I enjoy learning. I love reading. For me, it's a form of pleasure. Uh, to, and learning new things is a form of pleasure. And then explaining them to other people is a form of pleasure, which is why yeah. I think as a teacher, sometimes I get too much in that, um, let me fill the vessel rather than light the fire mode. And it's a challenge because that it just it gets me, I get, I get all excited about it. Um, is it worth anything more than that? You know, does it make better citizens for a better country? You argued we should have liberal education for everybody, at least as the basis for, you know, more specialized study. I like to think here in Israel, which is the center of science, technology, engineering, and math, right? Unbelievable startup nation that having thoughtful engineers is better than having not thoughtful ones and, and having them as colleagues, you know, a student who didn't study computer science, but who studied Plato might be useful for both a company uh, that's innovating in software, but also for a nation that's trying to figure out what is the life well lived and maybe should yeah. be yeah. thought of thinking about that. What are yeah. your thoughts on that? I think it does make better people and better citizens, at least better citizens of a democracy. Um, and, and, and sometimes people confuse that claim that it makes better people with the claim that it makes some people better than others. That is that if you're a liberally educated person, then you're better than somebody who is not liberally educated. And that's not what I, what I mean. What I mean is that if you're a liberally educated person, you would be a better you than a non-liberally educated you. That is that it makes you a better version of yourself. Um, and I think that a democratic society also is, is a better society with people that have this reflective capacity, this deliberative capacity, this communicative capacity. Uh, because self-governance, both at the individual level and, and at the collective level, uh, requires a certain kind of distance, a certain kind of um, uh, deliberative capacity that has to be cultivated. Um, I do emphasize this of a democratic society because liberal education is incompatible, in my view, with, um, I don't know how to put it, authoritarian, non-democratic forms, forms of governance, um, uh, which is, so it's not good for every society, it's not good for every kind of citizenship. Um, and there are certain, you know, there are certain structures within society, take, you know, the armed forces or, or, or something where, where they function by a kind of commitment to uh, following clear lines of authority, uh, not asking questions, or at least not raising questions then, um, kind of putting out, uh, factoring out uh, a certain kind of critical uh, autonomy. Uh, and that's fine in certain, in certain contexts, but if you're going to have a democratic society, a community, a polity that is self-governing, then liberal education is absolutely critical for that. Um, in fact, the possibility of democracy, democracy, right? The Greek word that means rule by the people. The possibility of rule by the people hinges, depends on people being equipped for autonomy.
for self-governance, and that is liberal education. Liberal education is, is education on, on how to be free, um, on how to manage freedom. So it does seem to me that there are both personal benefits, uh, that you live a better life, a, b- a better version of yourself, but this kind of cultivation and societal benefits that that accrue to democratic forms of government. Now, of course, there are all kinds of different ways in which you can organize a democratic form of government, the representative, direct, um, and all all kinds of quirks even within those um, those forms. But all of them, I think, require members of that self-governing community to have this kind of liberal education. When I talk about the education we try to provide at Shalem, I often quote my colleague Leon Cass, who says, you know, we're trying to produce thoughtful individuals. Thoughtful, that's a very deep word. It's, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's thrown around a lot, but it's trying to get it. It's a one, it's a one word summary of the kind of self-reflection and right. awareness that, that we've been dancing around for this, this entire time. And the other thing I often add is that it should also teach you the complexity of the world mm-hmm. and a little bit of intellectual humility. Right. And you could argue, I mean, there are a lot of things wrong with America today or the West, um, which we don't have to go into. But certainly we've we've walked away and chosen to leave and have been expelled from the kind of education that, that we're talking about. Our education in the United States, for example, has certainly become more professionally oriented, you know, t- taking the critique I offered earlier very seriously that, you know, this is expensive and it better may give you a bunch of skills. You can make a really good living. And you and I might believe, Roosevelt, that you can make a really good living with liberal arts education, but a lot of people are skeptical about that. So they, they choose something else. They major in business and they, they're very comfortable knowing that they're probably going to get a job. I actually think a liberal arts education is great for getting a job. And right. I, I have the experience of our students. But but I think when you're young, there's anxiety about it. And yep. uh, I, I certainly I respect that uh, and I understand it. But you could argue that our lack of experience, intellectual experience with the kind of books and ideas that we're talking about is part of the reason that America has become such a unhumble place, you could argue, a yeah. place where complexity is ignored. Yeah. And everything's simple. There's the good guys, the bad guys. I'm on the good guy team. You're on the bad guy team. And I don't need to listen to you. In fact, you're a traitor to the country. Right. And each side feels comf- confident about that. And similarly, you could argue that while democracy sounds good and it's it's uh, it's got some some nice things about it, you know. People are easily manipulated, and um, a lot of democracy have turned out really, really, really badly. Yeah. Um, and would you want to make the claim that I'm hinting at here that that without liberal arts education, the system that has sustained, say, the United States and many of the countries of the West, as we move toward a um, more utilitarian uh, ends oriented educational system that we're going to lose some of the underpinnings that make democracy work well and we're heading down a bad path. Yes, I am. I am comfortable with that claim. And I, I would put it this way. Um, liberal education is the enemy and the antidote to ideology. That is to the uncritical adoption of, 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 of accounts of truth. Um, and what we have in the American political landscape today is the increasing dominance of ideology, yeah. uh, where people, um, they have the answer without needing the data. They have the answer before the question arises. Well, and- they got plenty of data. Don't worry. They, they got the data. They just don't have all the data. So they're happy cherry picking with right. the, the stories. The, the, the yeah. answer is independent <laughs> of uh, the data. Higher education has not, so I could not, I wouldn't blame the crisis in our political discourse, kind of the discursive crisis in which America finds itself today. I wouldn't blame that on higher education, but I would say that higher education has failed to make its contribution to preventing that. Well, so- um, that is, there is a role in liberal education in the university by giving liberal education to creating a kind of individual that is to some extent 
immunized from the kind of ideological polarization and political demagoguery that 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 we see growing and 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 that increasingly characterizes American political conversation and that higher education has failed to do its part um, in, in in preventing that. So in some broad sense, it is a, our political crisis is a failure of our liberal education um, in some significant sense at the university level, also at the K through 12 level. Um, but we have failed in higher education and I fear are continuing to fail to deliver the kind of education that equips people to participate in this collective project of self-governance. I close with one more challenge. I'm not sure the word postmodernism is in your book, but you could argue that what has gone awry in American universities, you have a, you have a we talked about it today, it's in the book, uh, the way that research emphasis has affected the educational process for undergrads is, I think, dysfunctional and dangerous. Um, a better way to say it, it's it's inimical to the to the I think the, what could or should be the mission of of real education. If you're not careful, it doesn't have to be, but the, but there's a challenge. There's a challenge there. A critic of liberal education could say that the discourse that has failed in the United States and the West or is failed too strong, but is struggling, is the, is the outcome of liberal education. Liberal education, which said anything goes, there's different opinions, you can't be sure, all this humility that I've been talking about, you talked about it in a different way, that leads to people believing there's no truth. And that in turn has turned the American, the West's educational institutions into uh, moral relativists, people who don't believe stand up for what they believe in. Uh, and and that's the problem that we face today is that this is the natural evolution of liberal education. You can fact, certainly the departments of, of the humanities in, in modern American universities have left the field from yeah. the kind of education you and I have been talking about. They've turned to yeah. Marxism. They've turned to other, uh, these postmodern um, mm -hmm. disciplines, whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, I think that liberal education today exists in an intellectually hostile environment. The humanities, the dominant paradigm in the humanistic disciplines in the university makes liberal education impossible. For example, you can't have liberal education absent some commitment to the truth and absent the possibility of rational investigation into truth, into the human good, into virtue. Um, if these notions are emptied of content, as much postmodernist theory and the construction um, as a kind of philosophical movement does, if you empty those categories of meaning, the only thing you have left is power. Um, and again, that is the reigning intellectual orientation in universities today. And that makes liberal education actually impossible, which is why today, even in uh, humanities departments, or even in the traditional disciplines that are called and associated with liberal education, liberal education is actually not happening. Uh, what you end up is on the one hand with narrow disciplinary specialized pursuits, in the other, this posture of deconstructing all value systems and ending up with what? And then once you deconstruct all the value systems, all you end up with is a vying for power and dominance. Um, so yes, I think that, that, that the reigning intellectual climate in the university has been utterly, even cat been catastrophic for the practice of liberal education, which is why programs like Columbia's, programs like Shalem's, uh, there are other, and there are, uh, a handful, and I'm happy to say growing handful after a many decades of decimation, a growing um, number of programs that are re reconnecting with this older tra non-disciplinary tradition of liberal education. Uh, but it's an, up it's, it's an uphill struggle that we're facing. My guest today has been Roosevelt Montas. His book is Rescuing Socrates. Roosevelt, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. It's my pleasure, Russ.
This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.